Welcome to Keeping Athena Company. My name is Athena Kapenium, stand-up comedian, writer, podcaster, all those things. Also parent. Being a parent is a lot of fun, but my child isn't able to talk yet. Well, she can. She can say, Mama, and she can say, Hiya, but that's not really enough if I want to talk about critical race theory or... <laughs> you know, in what's happening with the Kurds and stuff. So every now and again, what I do is I invite a wonderful friend round to keep my company. And today, Hi. who's in my kitchen? I'm Sadia Asma. Sadia Asma is in my Sadia Asma off of the amazing podcast, No Country for Young, Young Women. Women. I almost said old women because I'm old. Uh, um, you are not old. I'm older than you. You are not old though. I'm ancient. No. I'm ancient. You're Welcome. youthful, man. What are you I'm talking youthful. about? I kind of feel like age isn't what you are, but it's what you know. Do you know what I mean? So, mm. like, I'm probably youthful because I don't know a lot. <laughs> but then some people are, are, are young, but they're really old because they're really experienced. Yeah. You know? um, but age stops meaning. Like, I've met, like, guys who are, like, in their 50s and they behave like children. <laughs> and I've met guys who are, like, in their 30s and they're so world wisely. So age stops meaning things after a while, I think. Mm. What do you think? I think it depends on accessibility like if you've had a kind of privileged grown um a, cri- a privileged upbringing then you probably can stay a lot more n- ignorant and naive yeah. blissfully ignorant like you mm. know what i mean because the doors are always open i think your age can demonstrate some of the adversity you've gone through and um we as comedians understand a hustle and that fucking ages you oh man yeah i'm definitely older <laughs> for all the miles that I've put into comedy. It takes yeah. away some of your innocence because, um, you know, you see you see things uh, and the, the things that you go through and experiences, you know, you start off loving comedy and being eternally optimistic and that is beaten out of you real quick. If you ain't, you know, a certain type of uh, privileged person. I guess what you mean. I've, I, I will ex- even expand on that and say it's not just privilege, but it's exposure. Because you could be privileged, but you can be have a diversity of friendship groups in terms of like class and nationality and race. But if you just the more privileged you are, the more likely you are to be surrounded by people who are just like you. If that makes sense, because it's a much more exclusive world. You're not exposed to challenge. I think, you know? yeah, it's totally right. But also, you and me, uh, being non-white women, we are real. Uh, mm. I'm not trying to say white women ain't real. No shade intended. But <laughs> holograms. Just, yeah. <laughs> but you and me, like, I'm not being funny, but I think we like truth. And good comedy is truth. But also, um, we ain't bullshitting. So, you know, you just uh, see things for what they are. And you try not to... Sometimes you understand that all that glitters isn't gold, man. Oh, yeah. What you say about truth is really, is really interesting. Because if comedy isn't truth it can never be funny mm-hmm. and that's why I was thinking about why I object a lot to what Dave Chappelle is doing at the moment like not all of it but like his like comedy on like um, trans people and stuff and I think it's because it's just not true like what the stuff <laughs> I need to commentate on the fact that you're, you're smiling at my child I'm sorry this happened in the last episode beautiful. no one was listening to me <laughs> And you're just like staring. I'm saying really important stuff. And I mean, you're just pouring her heart out, heart out, and I'm just like giving a smile to to her little one, who's well, beautiful. But kids don't normally smile at me. I need to take my opportunity when I can. Oh, okay. okay, fair enough. I don't know what you're doing. No, today. I understand what you're saying, Athena, yeah. and I'm. So, I really was listening because <laughs> what I'm saying my, for me, his early stuff, like for what it's worth, and killing them softly, had mm, so yeah. much soul and resonance. And even though it's probably over 20 years old, it still makes me laugh, and I would still tune into it. I'll probably watch it over 20 times but the latest stuff I think because he's um, eclipsed what a comedian can do yeah. and he's beyond a comedian's comedian he he has free license to uh to run you know the the stuff that he's doing now and although parts of it were really um tightly written and and his performance is obviously it was it was uh, excellent. I, I think some of the soul isn't there. Yeah, uh, totally. So, you know, the stuff he says about Kevin Hart, and I just like, I don't really have any sympathy for, Ke- for Kevin Hart because I think there are certain things that when you say them, they're so heinous or heinous. Is that the word? Heinous. Heinous. Yeah. You should be apologising for the rest of your life because what 
and the things he said about the gay community was so awful. If in 20 years time someone says I didn't like that, you should probably say you're right not to like it. It's it's not a big deal to say sorry. It doesn't take any energy. But I think he apologised and it wasn't enough. And also my problem yeah. is people who go and hunt, say you're doing well right now. Somebody yeah. going to go fish in your old social media post. That is some sick person. That's, that's very true. But the Kevin Hart story is unique for me. It was because the, the Oscars people said... If you apologise, keep the gig. Refuse to say, I've said this, I reject it, it's ridiculous, I'm ashamed. All let's do is say that. All let's do is a 240 character tweet to say that he kept his job. So when Dave Chappelle retold the story, it wasn't the correct story. But what I don't understand is how we, as the wider audience, are kind of encouraged to to follow or unfollow people based on some generalised um, group think, I think we should be able to, to to think and feel how we feel and decide that and have autonomy over our positions. So, for example, Tracy Morgan, he, he also had a similar outburst where he had um, used uh, derogatory terms towards homosexuals and then Tina Fey called him out and then a few years later after his accident, Tina Fey was like, no one needs to apologise for jokes and stuff, so which mm. one is it, Tina Fey? You're right. There's a lack of consistency. The thing that I don't like is the kind of the campaigning aspect of it. Yes. Like, I don't like him, so no one else can. Yes. Or I don't like this woman, There's so no, no one else can. Yeah. But it, you're right. You're talking about the Tracy Morgan thing is interesting because some, particularly black comedians, some black comedians say what they like. Now, Cat Williams should have been cancelled. I love Cat Williams. He should have been cancelled every day. No. But truth is, you can't argue with the truth, man. And the thing is, you know what? I can't stand and and you just because you have a right to be offended doesn't mean you're right. Mm. And people can make mistakes. Uh, people don't have to agree with everything I say on stage. My job is just to make them laugh, and they don't have to go away agreeing with everything. It doesn't mean I need to be cancelled. Yeah, uh, totally. And also, what I wanted to say is, in terms of going back to the Tracy Morgan thing, like, it's funny how there's all these other videos surfacing. So there was one of um, Justin Bieber saying the N-word. There's one of Justin Trudeau wearing blackface. There's, there's three of them. Four, yeah, there's loads yeah. of there's loads of these other like non black so there's white people's history come up and it's almost light hearted. It don't feel like it's got the same level of seriousness attached to it when a black comedian quote unquote transgresses. And so I I just have a problem with people trying to play detective when it's 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Eddie Murphy came out and apologised and then he was ridiculed for for things that he had said. Uh, He was like, you know, obviously being like what you said, that is no harm in apologising. He did that and people still... You know, people are never happy, babe. You can never impress everybody. You're right. People are never happy. And what's interesting now, what's happening in this conversation about what you can and can't say is that people are reducing racism not to what people know and don't know, but what to what they do and say. And if we keep attacking people for what they do and say and not understanding the, the education that took them to that point of saying or doing the wrong thing or saying or doing what a problematic thing, then we just have this circular conversation that's why i get a bit annoyed like um we're recording this a couple of days after the england match when they was in bulgaria and there's a bunch of football fans in bulgaria being racist making monkey chants do it you can stop them from doing those monkey chants but they're still at home raising children employing mm. people mm. Go, being in the workplace interacting and that's it's that those are the things that are really going to shape and change society like okay fine that might not be explicitly racist in the football stands but unless you're re- we're really addressing the way white supremacy works and the way white supremacy kind of poisons our minds to do things without thinking that are kind of like anti-black or um anti-asian or just Prejudice. anti yeah just anti-poc um nothing nothing changes so that's what annoys me we we, we talk about these incidents he said this they said that i want to talk about well yeah but they've led a life and they've lived this under a certain regime that edu- has educated them a certain way. So let's talk about that regime. Um, yeah, but ultimately, if you're telling the truth, I'll probably support you. And if you're not, I'll I'll, I'll say, oh, not for me, dog. Um, and I've just struggled a bit with his rationale. But you're right, because he's he's bigger than comedy. Mm. He he's, he can actually now say what he likes, and mm. his fans will always be there for him. Mm-hmm. Do you um, do sometimes just black audiences or just Asians or mm, just yeah, whites? And how do you find that different to maybe, I would say, horrible term, mainstream audiences? Um, I think it's really 
I mainly do what we call mainstream audiences. So that's basically just like white but mixed. That's yeah. It. And I mainly do black shows. The main difference, I'm really actually not that intellectual at all. They're just to do a setup. In a mainstream show, um, you tend to have like an opener, a middle spot, and a headliner, right? Yeah. Black shows, five headliners. You know, oh, wow. there's no cool. idea of open spot or yeah. new material. Everybody's equal. Everyone's equal, but the expectation is you've got to be brilliant. Mm-hmm. And if you're if you're not brilliant, you will get stared at. Like, why are you on this stage? Generally <laughs> speaking, there's a few black gigs that are like open mic material, new material. Yeah. Nights. So there's generally an expectation. You can't you can't really afford to fail at a, at a, a I would say a black circuit gig, which is a good thing. And that's actually why why I think black comedians tend to be better because you're thrown into the deep end. It's sink or swim. Because I've recently, this year, started doing more urban uh, or black gigs, whatever you, whatever the term is. And I, I like it. What I would say is that my experience is you... Um, I think you can take more risks. Yes. Um, yeah. I think they'll go with you a little bit. And I wonder if that's the, the reason why people like Chris Rock were able to come up because he had a supportive black audience that... that that was laughing. I wonder, like, because, and I, it's not to say I don't take risks with mainstream slash white audiences, but I think it's different risks. There's a cultural shorthand that exists amongst people of colour that means we can talk about things without feeling oh, a certain way. Yes, yes, Do you know what I mean? So yeah. you can talk about, um, you can talk about being a hijabi with me and I'll, I'll relate to that. And I'm not... You're going to get zoned out. I'm not going to... Clown pop. My sphincter is going to like seize up. up yeah. you know? Oh, jihad. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? That, that jihadi thing? Well, anyway, what's some biscuits? Yeah, like, that's what yeah, I yeah. they, they would, they would mm. get They would get maybe nervous yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah, the culture shorthand is there. It eliminates nervousness, awkwardness. Whereas, don't forget, why are people on the wrong side of history? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. that's just how it is. Most of them, some of them are on the right side. You know, the woman who did Gorillas in the Mist, she's on the right side. She <laughs> had that, the Gorillas. But a lot of them are on the wrong side of history. So, to hit to be heard that they they like, should they watch it and feel so they watch us and feel guilty you know should they watch us and feel like they are separations it's like no actually the only thing we really need to do is educate ourselves and then live our lives in a way that um, doesn't cause harm to others and mm-hmm. um, but if you don't educate yourself how can you live your life away in a way that doesn't cause harm to others because you don't know the harm you're causing mm-hmm. but we don't have to worry about those conversations so in many ways when we're in a space um up with without white people <laughs> majority <laughs> ethnic basically. yeah we, we 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 get the creative freedom that white people have any you know they take for granted that they that, that we can't even yeah that there isn't a term for because it's the norm yes precisely which is why so that's why a lot of people don't like the fact there's separate circuits i know there's a muslim circuit there's who doesn't um, like what do you mean like? some people feel like comedy's comedy man there should be one circuit but actually no comedy what is... are they talking about like what world are they living in because like how would we really have like it's good to to I don't know, there's probably some audiences that just... I, I guess that's why there are separate, uh, separated audiences because mainstream doesn't cater to everybody. Exactly, it doesn't cater to everyone and why should it? And I think because the idea that white people and white culture is, is the centre that refl- reflect everybody, they are going to think, well, why isn't there just one scene? So um, let me flip this on you. How about when, let's say, black comedians make it... Mm then they don't really honour the kind of urban black audiences as much and I just see them playing the mainstream rooms. How about that? Do you see that? I, I don't see that. I've, I've no, I've no, I don't know. Uh, talking from a UK context, mm. I can't think of one person who I feel has achieved an amount of success that behaves differently to how I knew them before their success. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, Delise Chaponda is... Oh, I like um, him. Delise is great and I've, I've known him for a long time. He's been super supportive um, like he had me support him on tour and stuff and the uh, stuff he says on stage now after he's done Britain's because he did really well on Britain's Got Talent a couple of years ago mm-hmm. I've not I don't discern any difference and he's really pro-African and he's balanced um, yeah balanced and just generally he's like funny man yeah it's just great great Jay Cry, a wonderful guy really like him another obviously the, the most the biggest example would be Mo the Comedian mm-hmm. um, so I've like I watched Mo's special and that's there was nothing there that I've not kind of 
seen him do before in terms of flavour and style. Um, if anything, he's he's for me amplified what mm-hmm. he normally does. Mm-hmm. So I can't think of it. Could you want to tell me who's who he's talking no, about? <laughs> I, I wasn't talking about um, material as such, but what I was talking about. I don't think I should name drop, but I think I either see these headliner um, caliber acts either on the black scene or on the mainstream scene. I don't see too much crossover. That's not their fault. No, I understand. Yeah. But so I'm just, okay. I think you're absolutely right. There were some. There were acts on who are on the urban scene or the black scene who should be yeah. on the mainstream, and I think it's that's not really their fault. It's sometimes it might be their fault just lack of knowledge in the mainstream. They're not going to Edinburgh. They're not maybe emailing management managers that could help them. They're not even, they're not applying for spots at Glee. Or they're not doing the Gong Show at the Comedy Store. Sometimes it's just because they're just being ignored. Yeah, um, but I feel like um, it's difficult to, and this is for any of of, of an act of any race. Yeah. it's difficult to feel like you're you're good enough or slash worthy. And I think some people have some acts have a, a miss kind of a, a miseducation of someone's going to call me it's going to happen like that and like you said what well, it's actually more proactive than that and you've got to be the one making those calls okay. but I think so it's tricky when you've achieved a certain level of success on the urban scene and then in your head you've got this thing where I'm only an urban act whereas actually you're an act you're an act and you deserve, but you've yeah. marginalised yourself because um, that's that's all you know what I would say is has someone who mainly or it started on a mainstream circuit and, and does most of her work on it. Mm. It's a very exploitative circuit, okay? You have to apply for lots of gigs, you get a lot of rejection. You know, I drove to Manchester last night for like not a large amount of money uh, and it was a headline spot. So they got a good bit of work out of me and I drove back again. But what I learn out of that experience and what the resilience and the, the stamina I get out of it and also what you learn out of doing that all the time in terms of being able to play any room makes you a better comic, okay? Now, because you don't have to work that hard on an urban circuit, which means, by, by which I mean, you don't, you're not going to drive to Manchester and back for no money because the money's good on the circuit. You're not going to play to tough rooms because the rooms are, ten, are more, people are more up for it because yeah. that's what the scene is like. Mm-hmm. They're more generous as the audience members. Maybe... The idea of doing what I did, you wouldn't do it, right? You're like, why would I? Yeah, that's graph. Yeah. So, but like, I use the word exploitative for a reason. Why should somebody who has a very successful career um, on the black circuit go to the mainstream circuit and do things that they would never normally do? There's a lot of great acts who who wouldn't drive for four hours earn 120 quid and drive for four hours back again you know why would they do that and I think I've reconciled myself to that lifestyle because I've been on the mainstream circuit for so long Mm. if you if you wouldn't do it for black people why would you do it for white people right it's a very hard mindset to get into and I think after a while you're not going to get into it because it's so exploitative you know it's so exploitative so I think it's a question of they have higher respect higher self respect actually (laughs) yeah you have to have no self love and self worth and self respect (laughs) to be as good as we are I think exactly think about the things you've done for comedy yeah yeah yeah. and I mean even I do (laughs) I'm not going to name names I do quite high profile stuff yeah for very little money yeah. It's the kind of stuff that gets you 200 likes on Instagram mm. and but if people would see what that means in terms of remuneration they'd be shocked Yes, let's talk about saying no. When was the last time you said no? Ooh, that's a nice question. When I offered you something to eat. No, um, <laughs> I just said it there. Um, no, no, I mean, I guess in the industry, uh, it's it's hard to say no. Like, I understand what you're saying about those really um, poorly remunerated jobs, but I think it's, I think that's what, I guess what you mean by it's, it being exploitative at times because you can end up making a, a club or some some kind of event a lot of money or or attracting at least you know I don't know it just how how do you have self worth when you kind of are pimping yourself out to a degree? I am um, I think it's, this is a really important question actually especially I think at the stage of the careers we're at where we're kind of like we have some profile we have moderate success we get lots of work offers. Um, and we have to decide how best to use our time. Mm. And I've I've been thinking about it more now I've got a child because I've got childcare. So before I could say yes to everything and there was nothing we need to sacrifice. Mm. But now it's different because I've got a responsibility. Independent. So this is what I do. I think about the money, first of all. Am I getting paid? Mm. And then if the money doesn't convince me, I think, well, is it work that I would regret 
say no to. Mm. That's it. Can I live without this work? Yeah. Um, and that's a really... I, I actually use that same thing for shopping. I hate shopping. I think shopping is boring. So if I see something, <laughs> like a pair of trainers or a bag, I think, can I live without it? Yeah. And if the answer is yes, then I do. That that seems very logical to people who love shopping and, and just want to <laughs> waste money. I don't, don't take that kind of time or, or a little bit of seconds to to make that decision because you've fallen in love with a product so quickly but I guess what I meant is if you say no too much we don't want to be labeled as unavailable or diva or difficult and it is good to use the autonomy but I think we need to use it selectively and very carefully because it's not I think that for the people I've come across in the circuit are really nice and helpful but it can only take one small thing to get out of hand before all of a sudden you ain't getting called I think you're right but I what this is how I handle things most times you get offered something it's not a one-off opportunity yeah if someone says would you come and do my gig they run that gig every week or yeah. every month so you're just like I can't do it this month can I do it next month yeah if it's a broadcasting opportunity mm. it's never normally a one-off thing it's mm. it's a show that's brought, put, put out every Friday or whatever so mm. I always say if I, if I don't want to do something it's not possible now mm. um, I have availability this month or it's not possible now um, but ask me again so I never say no never I always say oh it's not possible now um, and they might ask you again and you might say no again but then if it's an opportunity you don't want it doesn't matter if it gives you if they change their mind about you because it's an opportunity you never wanted do you sometimes get work because some other act is not available yes all the time absolutely I was talking about this the other day actually um, with someone and someone who'd asked me last minute it, actually it turned out he'd just been disorganised so I, I did a I recorded a podcast and I got like two days notice and he said I was just organised that's why it's th- and I thought someone else had cancelled but my take on it is that I'm competent but I'm not famous so uh, why would you book me when yeah. you can have a more famous person mm. right but when that's why I love cancellations because I get a chance to do what I can do um, on a platform and people are more grateful because I've saved their lives I f- struggle when it's the whole black woman thing like I'm not an in- I'm not interchangeable with other no. black woman is not a f- genre of comedy but all I can do is be myself and prove to them that they haven't replaced like for like they've just replaced a human with another human however on the other hand I do respect people wanting to amplify minority voices <laughs> so I'm just watching you struggle with sorry with yeah child. she's ready she's like I've had enough of you babe she wants to climb the couch. Oh, oh yeah, keep her. Yeah, keep her there. She's climbing the couch okay. now. She treats it like a little mountain. So she just, <laughs> just climbs it. So yeah, what do you do? You like do you like it being um, like when Fatia councils? Do you have to, do you get called? No, I haven't. I haven't had her leftovers as yet. I wouldn't say no to it, but I haven't. I haven't had that. Or if I had, if it has happened, I haven't been made aware of it. Um, I think. I think what I've experienced is not being on a lineup with other. Asian women mm. um, so that I think it, it shows that they they it's moving it's moving in the right direction in that there is representation so um, yeah that's good I find it tricky uh, pleasing Muslim audiences because I think that they are less comedy they have been they have not been to comedy as much as black and white people and mm. so um, if you're trying to be maybe subversive or, or kind of speak on different levels uh, about topics that they um, find taboo I think it's difficult with uh, just Muslim conservative crowds yeah no you're totally right um, so comedy um, there's no 4-4 and if the audience is shit like a night is shit and I'm not saying Muslim audiences are shit audiences but yeah. I am saying that if they're not au okay with the with the conventions of yeah, stand-up comedy what you're trying to if, do yeah, if they're not if, for the, the same way white audiences might be afraid of the word jihad you know Muslim conservative audiences might be afraid of the word sex yes. and because it's not normally spoken about um, yeah. um, in, in and what I've noticed I've done a few Muslim gigs what I've noticed is there tends to be family nights out uh, and, yeah. and it, you tend to see like parents with kids it's got, and like, brothers and sisters 82 year olds to 8 year olds yeah. so if your content is not family suitable mm-hmm. it's very difficult to laugh about sex when, you're, when your brother's next to you or when your dad's next to you so this is this. I mean I don't want to talk about it because it's so boring but this is what, this is what annoys me about people complaining about um restrictions put on material sometimes you get booked to a gig and you'll be told to not talk about certain things Mm. if you know you've got families in the audience Mm. you probably don't want your acts talking about like explicitly things because you know that someone sat next to their granddad and they don't want to laugh at these things 
So that's my experience of, of kind of the odd Muslim gig that I've done. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we just have to tailor ourselves to the audience. I think, I think the problem for me is that it's an assumption that I'm just going to be a cardboard cookie of just the same way as you said, you're not just a black woman, you're Athena. I'm Sadia and I don't think, I think there's a lot of assumptions made which I find frustrating, which hopefully as we become more um, famous, if you want to call it that. Which <laughs> yes, I do want to call it that. Thing. Yes. But um, I know you're a positive person, that's why I thought I'm going to go there. <laughs> but hopefully as we gain traction and become mainstream, um, uh, it will be less of a problem. But then... You know, I think it's all lessons along the way, but I think there's learning on both sides of, of it. It's not just us tailoring ourselves, but it's also them feeling like, should I be bringing my four-year-old to this gig? Probably not. Let's hire a babysitter. I don't know. Is that is that asking so much? Like, um, I think that's every circuit is unique and has its conventions. And the same way you can do a work, you're going to be full of stags and hens. And that's a very disruptive audience to that's pay. True. So we we are, we shape ourselves to our audience. Like I said, the audience is part of the gig. There's no fourth wall, and so whatever they want, they either get or we understand why they didn't laugh because we didn't give them what they wanted. And yeah. I, I do think that there should be more etiquette to stand up comedy. Generally, people should should come to the show, helping us to be as funny as possible. Yeah. But that we don't live in an ideal world and some people come to the show with their children, with their grandparents, with their they or they come with expectations that we're going to hear jokes about. I don't know, like blinds yeah. and chairs. And no, you're not. You're going to hear jokes about things that you probably haven't spoken about openly for years, maybe. But that's, I think that's part of it. I think a lot of the time, what we end up having to do is find find our own audiences anyway. So it's important that rather, I'm contradicting myself, but rather than shape ourselves to audiences, we should also find our voice and be consistent because then the audiences that are good for us will come to us. Yeah, you're definitely right about building your own audience and following. I think that's crucial uh, to be able to uh, sell a book, to be able to get your own perfume, to be able to get your own TV show. It's all these things. I, I don't know why I record this podcast and now she's got my car keys and she's shaking them around. She's it's... the happiest <laughs> she's been though. I actually didn't want to talk about comedy. Oh my God, sorry. <laughs> we're talking about what you want to talk about. Is there anything else you'd like to get off your chest today? And it can be about comedy if you want. Talk to Auntie oh, About race, really. Oh my gosh. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Go Athena. On. I'm so sorry. But you are really... She's read a lot of books and I haven't. So I have to take the learning uh, opportunities where I can. So I guess the question I wanted to say, right, is... When do you see race and how much do you see it? Because I think sometimes it's you, it's overkill or, you know, it's either you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. That's a really, it's when do you see it and how much you see it? So I see it immediately because skin is the largest organ on our bodies. Anybody that says they don't see race is blind. Yeah. And then death. You can hear race as well <laughs> as it happens. You can smell it too. Yeah. As it happens, skin is an awful indicator of race. The best racial indicator is your hair. Uh-huh. Hair is the best racial indicator. You mm. can see that someone's mixed race through the texture of their hair, for example. Mm. Anyway, oh, please rattle my keys. That's just what I need for this recording. Please. <laughs> hey, you can sound mix this up, don't worry. Like sound mix, really. I, I don't even know what that is. If I take them from her, she'll start crying. Yep, she's looking happy. Socks. She's not looking happy. Ha- here's your rubber ducky. Here's your ducky. Oh, oh god. Oh lordy okay, lord. Let's let's just let's keep her away from the mic. Anyway, so I see it immediately. <laughs> um, what was the first? That was the first. And when do you see it? And then what's the second? How bit? often? Like, because the thing is, like, we're people as well as our backgrounds. And I don't know, I just think I haven't found an answer to this question. Okay, I've got an answer. Yeah, go on. There you go, life-changing. So, like I said, I see it immediately. Just because you see it doesn't mean you have to act on it. Mm. Okay? So, a lot of people think racism is seeing race. Racism is treating somebody differently because of the race you see. In actual fact, the definition of racism is treating someone differently. That's all racism is, is at its core. And so, obviously, that can mean um, not serving them in a queue. Could mean killing them, okay? Mm. But you're still treating them differently to how you treat someone else. So you can see race, but you can then say, oh, you can see, I'm not going to make assumptions about this person. I'm not going to treat them in a certain way. Um, I'm not going to adjust the way I, I act around them. For and- me, what is more problematic than microaggressions is the bigger scale of, of um, industry about Islamophobia or, or any type of hate. Um, I think institutionalised discrimination is, is a bigger problem to me than racism. 
Oh, you're absolutely right. Because if someone yeah. don't like me, they don't like me. I don't give a fuck. Like, don't you're, like me, this, innit? This, like, this, sorry, this I saw in front of babies. Is that, this, this is why this is, I don't have kids. But have yeah. you heard the earlier <laughs> podcast? Literally, they've all been dropped. The words, <laughs> everything. Oh, it's, Lord, like Lord. I said, social services are going to knock it on this. <laughs> Her first word is going to be like, unpleasant. oh, no. It's going to be beep, have to be beeped out. Um, <laughs> right. So you're absolutely right. We talk too much about, again, what people do and not the structural mm. um, context that we live in that have made them do the things that they do. So, for example, we talk a lot about... We talk a lot... Because football's been on my mind. We talk a lot about how there aren't any black football managers, right? But we don't talk a lot about how young black kids who get into football... Um, are seen by the you know the mainly white coaches that recruit them mm-hmm. um, and then train them in a certain way right to then make them think oh you can run fast but they might put their arm around the other white kid and say you've got a good footballing brain right mm. so that's the issue and then we talk about what happens in the interviews when they're being interviewed for jobs and what happens when they retire but what we what kind of conversation are we having about how these kids influence these footballers when they're eight years old so we don't get to the core of it and we don't get to the structural racism part mm-hmm. of it we talk a lot about um, police officers in America shooting people uh, particularly black people but we don't talk a lot about the kind of people that want to become police officers in the first place mm-hmm. and that's the real issue the point at which they pull the trigger is the end point yeah. the end point is when they're like I want to be a police officer why? because I believe in white supremacy right? Yeah. so you're, you're totally right and with the problem with, with that discussion is that it requires knowledge it's an academic discussion so I think it d- it requires access and it requires yeah. real people with intention for change yeah and if that isn't there or if I don't know I think it, it's just um, sometimes it feels like you're fighting something you can't see you know I, I describe it as trying to empty the ocean with a bucket you know ever, mm. try going to Brighton with a bucket and going I'm going to by stopping by just saying you can't do that and you can't say that will never will never end racism the only thing that will end it is basically um, the people who built um, racism as in modern racism which is basically white people deconstructing the de- de- deconstruction of the structures so for example I, this is a very long winded story I'm going to tell you but it's an interesting one do you remember when Mark Duggan died yes there was an inquest into his death, okay? Mm-hmm. And the inquest was going to decide whether or not the person who killed him was going to go on trial. And there was a jury. Uh, I'm probably using the wrong terminology, but there was a jury. Now, normally, when people, these juries are presented with the evidence, they get to say, they get to use probability. They get to say, we think probably there's enough evidence here to prosecute this person. And then we can put them on trial. Mm. For some reason, when Mark Duggan's inquest took place, the coroner gave an instruction to the jury they said don't use probability either know 100% that this person killed him or find him um, not guilty or not uh, or not um, uh, you know have it not possible for it to go to trial I'm using the wrong terminology Mm. now what gave the coroner or who gave the coroner that instruction why was it so important that that police officer didn't go on trial. Why was it so important? Mm. So that's the structure. The, for some reason, some ephemeral, untangible thing, whether told change of process. Exactly. Now, what is it? Now, the coroner could have said, "That's a ridiculous instruction. It makes no sense. It's incredibly unique. Very rare. I'm not going to do it." But he didn't. Okay. So I don't know what to say. How do we fix that? How do we get? How do how, how do we get that one individual justice? And then think about all. Incidentally, there's been about 1,600 deaths in custody, only one convicted police officer. So how do we get... Why is it so important that these people are protected? I watched um, this movie, The Day Shall Come. I highly recommend it to anybody. It's by Chris Morris. And it, it reinforced something that I was researching a few years ago. Oh, um, she wants to go on the floor, sorry. Cool, that's okay. So I read this book by Arun Kandani called The Muslims Are Coming. And basically... You read books. You told me I read books. That was a while ago. I retired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I read that book, The Muslims Are Coming. And basically what it was about is FBI uh, staff entrapping people who are either, you know, uh, mentally unwell or just not really financially strong, enticing them with financial remuneration to go and kind of do do an attack and then arresting them. Mm. That was what was going on and a movie captures that kind of racial ethnic profiling. Um it's such an important movie. It's so sad because mm. I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but I think the system systemic um corruption it is what we really should be concerned about because if somebody gives me a dirty look or whatever, 
it don't bother me or if it does then I have to get over it whereas if if people like my brothers and sisters are being imprisoned for 15 30 years um without due process or fair trial that's their life man. yeah you're absolutely right it's, it's the system and we con- and that's on, on the, and I think people know that and that's why we concentrate on what individuals do because then they don't have to worry about changing the system because they know the system benefits them right yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah let's talk about the Nazi dog because we don't, they don't have to talk about police injustice or court you know brutality or things, or things like this and, and just I would just say I would say one final point on the structural racism something that we often forget is that we all live in a world right and it has various things by design so like a banking system basically or a home ownership system a political system a financing system them. those systems were designed centuries ago by racists they were never designed to benefit us and because um bizarrely enough this is the second time this week i'm saying this because white europeans of a certain nature so white christian straight catholic europeans won the social economic economic and cultural global modern war might change in 500 years but this is the world we live in now they invented systems to benefit them so when we we live in these systems now and we wonder why they don't work for us they were never designed to work for us why is boris johnson a prime minister you know we no one voted for him we didn't vote for him and no one likes him but he's prime minister because the system wasn't designed to put in the most popular prime minister the system was designed to put in the prime minister who would best protect who would best oh not keys no the keys are too noisy to design the prime to protect the, the prime minister who would best protect the, in, the interests of of the people who design the system and it is the ancestors or the um, antecedents I'm really bad at the word you know their kids and their kids and their grandkids and grandkids who benefit from those systems and I think it's ancestors. very yeah it's very hard I would say for like a white person with a certain degree of privilege to connect the way they enjoy their life now to their actions of incredibly racist people centuries ago they can't it blows their mind but well, it doesn't blow our mind because we have material it has a material impact on our lives so that's the truth that we need to get more people to understand and and then empathise with it and then be motivated to do something about it. It's all out there. If you read James Baldwin, you'd know all this. You know, but... You know. So two points off that. A, I don't vote. <laughs> and when pop stars tell me I need to be voting, I'm like, get off my screen. Make a song or dance or please get out of my face. And second of all, but when there are like these Asian representatives like Sajid Javid and then when they become one of them they forget where they're from or who they are or who their constituency really look like Mm. and so I think um, a lot I don't know it's not always a numbers game um, but I don't think that politicians operate on the right and wrong perspective as as much as comedians are asked to (laughs) No, and also it's just on the Sajid David note and Kitty Patel note as well and James Cleverly and Crazy Quarting. You don't have to be white to be an agent of white supremacy. You don't have to be a, a man to, to um, do an agent of patriarchy. You know, you can just, you can subscribe to those so-called, the, the rules or, the, or the, the context of those things because they might personally benefit you. It's about like being in the matrix, you know. You can get out of the matrix and you can live a life that benefits you personally and it's not a truthful life, but you get the rewards for that. Um... So I don't, I don't find, when you think about how many African leaders pillage their countries and put money in Swiss banks, being a dickhead isn't a uniquely white thing. This is something we forget. So I don't, when I criticise people like Sajid Javid, it's not because I feel like they're unique in, in their ignorance. I feel like they've, they've had the choice. They could either fight a fight or be part of, um, part of a story that is positive and progressive or they can serve themselves and they're serving themselves because some people like to serve themselves and again the system rewards that yes so that's why the system Mm. that's right the structural system that was designed by by white people um to basically say if you want to be successful you have to think like us if you want to be successful you have to sound like us if you want to be successful you've got to dress like us you know what if you want to be successful you've got to worship our god too the system, right? So if we can start to unpick the system and start to, um, then we can get somewhere. As, as you rightly say, I totally agree. Um, but we're not there yet. And it, because of social media, because we're amplifying the wrong arguments, the wrong solutions, it's actually making it worse. Because people who don't know so much about this stuff, they're doing it innocently too. When people are saying this Nazi punk is disgusting, they're tr- trying to do the right thing. They really are. It's not always coming from a place of ignorance. selfishness. Yeah. yeah, They're trying to do the right thing. But like I said, they might not have read James Baldwin. They haven't read Audrey Lord. They haven't uh, watched the movies you've watched, read the books that you've read. On the one hand, you could say, well, at least it, they're showing uh, hatred for something that is wrong. Mm. But... We, I just think that the light needs to be shined on, on bigger issues. Um, 
that we can affect rather than just personal emotional like sometimes we need to take ourselves out of it and stop being so emotional because it's easy but like why are there still black shootings in america why are there so many black people being killed i want that to stop and that hasn't stopped and so me being upset about it is is fine Uh, maybe that's for me to deal with personally but I don't think sometimes if you're emotional, uh, you can get the best results. Um, and and people, I don't know. It's just it's you not are, like it's selfish. People are emotional, and they're emotional, and the emotion replaced the intellect. So because yeah. they're not intellectually informed on things, they just react emotionally. I'm gonna say two things to that. Um, I totally agree with you. And with my thing is with the Me Too movement, it's very Western focused. Mm. And I would say if you think you know patriarchy, move to India. A couple of days ago, somebody found a, a, a girl fetus buried alive. Oh, no. Because and, and most people will know that there's a huge gender ratio issue in India because Indian um, people who are pregnant with girl babies have abortions because it's considered <laughs> such a terrible thing to have girl babies. And, and obviously we've got a big rape issue in, mm. in India too, which had, was just high profile for a little while. And then it's... <laughs> So when people are like, oh, I was on a train and someone manspread, I'd be like, you don't know half of it, girl. <laughs> don't know the half of it. So you're absolutely right. We, we have the wrong conversations and they're very selfish. The second thing... Um, oh, my gosh. <laughs> the second I'm going to say is we're going to have to wrap up because she's killing my car keys. Okay, no worries. I don't, to, don't worry. I need to find car keys to drive you back to the station. It's okay, honey. Um, Do you so, want to have a look? Um, we'll look after. Okay. Um, I don't know where they are. Um, they're probably under a mat somewhere. So thank you. I, I thought oh, we thank ta- you. I thought we'd chat about girly things, manicures, pedicures, what? you know, eyebrow <laughs> threading. Um, this is gone into another direction eyebrows are on point but it's always like you're very uh, well informed and um, it's always rich conversations with you oh, so uh, this, this is exactly what I want because if it's not rich conversations with me it's with the baby going I want your keys okay I have the keys um, so do you, 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 um, talk about your podcast No Country for Young Women it's fantastic um, thank you I love it so oh thank you <laughs> so we're on our third series it's out every Tuesday and you can also subscribe on BBC Sounds catch up on the first couple of series we've had some amazing guests and we're trying to find out what home is um, in the first couple of series we were exploring what is it like if you're uh, British but you don't look British or feel British and so it is kind of trying to explore issues of identity and um belonging and sometimes talk about relationships as well. <laughs> and white supremacy <laughs> well uh, it's the BBC babe so we, yeah I mean <laughs> that'll be season four have, have I'll, put the, I'll put them to right okay she's gone we're going to Paris this weekend <gasps> yeah so um, I think we are going to talk about um, the different constructs uh, and, and the legacy of colonisation so I'm, I'm looking forward to oh, some right, interesting I'm, I'm debate waiting, I'm waiting for my Eurostar ticket and that sounds fun I'll, I'll pack my bags now um, Sadia so thank you so much for coming to thank you for having Having me, Athena, always a pleasure. So that was Sadia Azmat. She is a comedian. She is a professional podcaster. She has a proper podcast, not the shambles that you're listening to right now. A proper one on BBC Sounds um, and um, Baby Whisperer. You should have seen her and my child getting on. I felt like a third wheel. I think I found a new childminder, um, let alone... Um, a good conversation list here uh, but yeah Sadie is great do find her she's a stand up comedian and a podcaster like I said so look her up she is brilliant um, and I should say this but off the mic at the end of the microphone at the end of the recording sorry she said my baby was the only baby that didn't make her cry she thinks it's a headscarf that makes babies cry but my baby didn't cry so maybe that means I'm raising my child right to be free of prejudice and racism and awful assumptions um, I'll take all the credit for that or maybe she just liked Sadio because she was holding a pear and she ended up eating the pear that Sadio was holding anyway I am rambling let me wrap up this cod task by saying thank you so much for listening my listeners are great you are wonderful for, for tuning in or streaming or whatever it is you do downloading <laughs> oh my gosh D- this noise my child's got a mouse in a, in in their hands and now they're waving it around as in not a real mouse a computer mouse they're not I've, i don't let her play with rodents anyway thank you for listening do what you normally do with podcasts you like subscribe share like comment tell your friends tell your family tell your mum tell your dad tell your grands tell your sisters tell your kids tell them all i would love for them to to join in this conversation thank you for listening and we'll catch up next time